mi nombre es Alana. Bonjour, je m'appelle Alana. Hey, hey church family. family, hope you're all doing well. I hope you're all coping through lockdown so far. Um, I just wonder if maybe you've done some of the things we've done um, in the videos before, or in reality, if you've done a lot of this instead. Anyways, uh, we want to challenge you this week to try and message someone in the church family. See how they're going, make sure they're doing all right, maybe pray for one another, uh, just checking in with our family. Uh, we're looking forward to what Quinton has to say and hopefully um, being able to see you all shortly. Love you. So it was meant to be a settle in Sunday. Hope you guys are all in your Uggs and your Udis um, as you join me to uh, delve into today's message. Special friends, we once again find ourselves sharing a pre-recorded message and not meeting in person. Life for the moment has reverted back to Zoom church. Um, for many of us, Zoom schooling, which we know is tough, and certainly Zoom from a work point of view. And whilst it's easily, uh, easy to get uh, fatigued by it all, now is the time that we actually need to do the best that we can to push through and not actually give up meeting like this and actually pressing in to all that God is calling us into corporately, but also personally. And even though it's a little bit odd and it can sometimes be somewhat uncomfortable meeting online like this, yeah, I really want to encourage you to continue to press in. I was so encouraged by all of you uh, that took the time to dial into the Pray for South Africa prayer meeting that we had on Wednesday night. And what an amazing time that it actually was. And we started to hear some reports on Thursday morning of positive stories coming through. And it really does fill me with hope that things there will revert back to normality. So thank you for taking the time to uh, pray with us. And as I mentioned at the beginning of my pre-recorded message the last time, Please continue to be intentional about reaching out to everybody and ensuring that everybody in the life uh, of the church and in the family is connected and cared for in some way. I love the encouragement that uh, Joel shared with us during the course of the week and the challenge that he actually put out to us about reaching out to somebody specific and potentially shining a light into their lives. I must also say that I'm super excited for uh, the quiz that's going to be happening tonight. Um, I certainly hope that the technology all works. And regardless, it should be a really good laugh. And after a really long and somewhat crazy week, it's actually exactly what I'm looking forward to uh, to, uh, to to end the week. I know that Kate has actually been uh, just going through those, you know, those Trivial Pursuit boxes or packs or cards. She's been brushing up on her ancient history and her science knowledge. So uh, she's certainly going to be a dark horse for this evening. So for today, as many of you would have seen, if you've been following on the social media um, and Facebook, you would have seen that we're going to be looking at another Hall of Fame hero. Once again, providing us with the opportunity to reflect on the life of a particular character in the Bible, the life of someone that walked this earth and encountered God, God in various ways. I pray that as we delve into the message today, that we would really take encouragement from their journey and their battle. In fact, let me pray quickly. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, for the ability for us to uh, be able to meet like this. Lord Jesus, I just pray that wherever we are at, this morning or this evening, uh, listening to this message, Lord, that you would be with us, Holy Spirit, encouraging us and taking us forward. We really do just pray, Lord, that you continue to keep us safe during this time until we're able to meet again in person. Be with us as we continue to delve into your word, Heavenly Father. Amen. So who is it today? And he has a clue. He would describe himself as timid in nature, and he viewed himself as unqualified and incompetent. And I'm sure many of us could actually resonate with those thoughts, and we all feel that at times. I know that I certainly do. 
But as we unpack the story today, I hope that we can learn how God uses our character's weaknesses, but fundamentally his faithfulness to accomplish great things and amazing victories. So let's start with a bit of a crazy question. What if God came to speak to you? What would you do? Some of us would likely fall flat on our face knowing that we're not worthy to be in his presence. Some of us may jump up and down and actually celebrate his presence. Some of us may want to sit down with a cup of tea and ask a million questions of our creator. And some of us may even question, is that really you, God? Not trusting and believing it really is God? What would you do? Now let's take it a step further. What if you really just didn't believe very much in yourself? You thought of yourself as unqualified and incompetent. And God was calling you to lead his people to victory against a vicious, brutal, and fierce army. One that you had actually been hiding from for many, many years. How would you respond? Well, that's the story that we're going to be looking at today. The remarkable story of Gideon. Gideon's story can be found in Judges 6 through 8. And I'd encourage you to take some time to read it. I'm going to be telling it again as a bit of a story form today just to help us grasp uh, what it is that we're looking to get across. And as we prepare to look at Gideon and what he was going through and how he reacted to God, let's do a quick recap of what was going on in the nation of Israel at this time. I think it's always good for us just to get a little bit of context. Importantly, this is the time before the land had any kings. The period of Judges is known as one of the lowest times in Israel's history. The last verse of the book of Judges puts it in perspective, and it reads like this. It says, In those days Israel had no king, and the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Imagine for a moment what the repercussions of that would look like. Absolute carnage, absolute chaos, more than likely. The nation of Israel was going through some kind of rinse and repeat cycle. The same cycle over and over. You see, they would turn away from God and be disobedient and sinful. Then God would send an opposing nation to come against them. The people would be oppressed and they would cry out to God. God would remain merciful to, to their cries and he would go about raising up a judge. It was usually a military leader that would lead the people um, and they would go about defeating their enemy. They would then repent of their sinfulness and that judge would lead them for many years until he died. And shock, horror, spoil alert, the people would return to their sinful and their disobedient ways. And the cycle would start over again. Rinse and repeat. And in some ways, and maybe a bit, more, a bit of a controversial statement, but I don't think that we've learned too much from their mistakes and sinfulness. Still to this day, we often go through those cycles in our own lives. But thankfully, just like for them, God remains merciful and continues to shower, show, shower us in his grace and his love. So this is where the Israelite people find themselves. They're in one of these cycles, and at this time, they've been oppressed by the Midianites. And as we read in Judges 6, we know that Wherever the Israelites planted their crops, thieves and raiders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack them. The robbers would encamp against them and they would devour the produce of their land as far as Gaza and leave them with nothing to eat. 
taking all of their sheep, their goats, their cattle, and their donkeys. The Bible tells us that the enemy hoarders were as thick as a field of locusts and too numerous to count. Can we even consider the numbers? This battle, this oppression, went on for seven years. And as a result, in Judges 6 verse 6, we read that Israel was reduced to starvation. And at this point, the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. At their darkest hour, at their time of need, they cried to the Lord. And after rebuking their behavior about their ongoing worship of false gods, the scene is set for our timid hero of faith to be introduced to the story. Now, there's a decent amount of scriptural text that I won't be able to go through, but I would encourage you you to read. But the highlights package goes as follows. The angel of the Lord came and sat beneath a great tree, and Gideon, the son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a winepress to hide the grain from the Midianites. This important fact can't be overlooked and it highlights Gideon's timidness, his fearfulness and his nervous character. The bottom of a winepress was literally a small well that Gideon was hiding in to thresh and separate the wheat. This wasn't a usual practice for them and, for, and, and where they, they, they generally threshed out the wheat. The angel pops his head over the side of the wine press and his first interaction with Gideon is to address him and say, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. To our earlier question, what would you do if God came to speak to you? Well, Gideon questions, is it really you, God? And in an act of real boldness, questions why God had abandoned them and handed them over to the Midianites. And I love this because God doesn't give him the explanation that he's looking for. He simply provides him with direction and encouragement. And he affirms Gideon for the task ahead. He simply says, go with the strength you have And rescue Israel from the Midianites. I'm sending you. And then Gideon shows little to no no self-confidence. And he says, but Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe. And I'm the least in my entire family. He is admitting that he is pretty much just the runt of the litter. He doesn't think he can accomplish what the angel of the Lord is asking him to do. The Lord says to him, I will be with you and you will destroy the Midianites as if you are fighting against one man. And then in a pretty bold move, Gideon replied, if you are truly going to help me, show me. Show me a sign to prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. How many of us can resonate with Gideon's questioning and request of God? If it is you, God, if this is your will, if it really is you, God, then give me a sign. It's bold. But as we go on, we'll see how God responds. So Gideon goes home and he prepares a young goat and some baked bread for the angel of the Lord. And after putting the food down on a rock and pouring a broth over it, the angel of the Lord touched the food with the tip of his staff and fire flamed from the rock and consumed all he had brought. Then the angel of the Lord disappeared and Gideon then realizes That it was an angel of the Lord. And he cries out, O sovereign Lord, I am doomed. I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. So the angel of the Lord comes back to Gideon. And he tells him to destroy the idols his father and the people in the town worship. 
And after you tear them down, you are to build a new altar and you are to dedicate it to the Lord. He did this and he named it Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. And Gideon decided to wait until it was night to do this because he was afraid. And he gathered 10 men and he did exactly as they were told. And due to his antics the night before, the people of the town hear about this and they wanted to kill Gideon. And thankfully, Gideon's father steps in for them and he says, let the idols fight their own battles. And at this point, Gideon was free. And the Bible soon moves on and afterwards the Midianites were moving into the land and they formed an alliance against Israel. And I love this part because there's no request, there's no appeal, there's no cries for help. We read that the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with power. And Gideon goes on to blow a ram's horn as a call to arms. At that moment, God equipped and fortified Gideon for the task ahead. Gideon had the Spirit of the Lord cloak him with power. And what do we know about Gideon? He once again needs assurance. His lack of faith, belief, and trust in the Lord. And he once again needs proof. So he reverts to testing God again. And once again, he's making his actions conditional on God's response or God's own actions. If you do this for me, God, then I will lay my trust in you. And I can't help but look at the similarities of how Gideon responds to how we respond in our own lives too. So Gideon goes about and he lays out a woolen fleece on the floor and he tells God, if only the fleece has dew on it and is wet and the ground is totally dry, then I'll believe you will save Israel. In the morning, Gideon gets up and he picked up the piece of wool and he is able to wring out an entire bowl full of water while the ground around it was bone dry. Now we must be ready for war, for war right? No, not yet. You see, Gideon still wasn't convinced. And we know that he's on thin ice with God here because he says, please don't be angry with me, but let me make one more request. Let me use the fleece for one more test. This time, let the fleece remain dry and the ground around it wet with dew. And true to form, God remains patient and merciful to Gideon. In the morning, the fleece was dry and the ground around it covered with dew. Okay, now we're ready for war. Judges 7 verse 3 tells us Gideon had 32,000 men to fight. And Judges 8 verse 10 tells us that the Midianites had 135,000. Not great odds, is it? But God has a great sense of humor and a great way to call us to trust him. You see, he told Gideon, anyone who is timid or afraid to fight can leave. So not one, not two, not a hundred, but 22,000 men leave. Gideon is left with 10,000 men. You see, the ultimate purpose here was for God to get the glory. God knew that if they, the Israelites, defeated the Midianites with a large number, then they would boast that the victory was theirs. The people needed to know that it was God doing this. It was not their doing. There is no way that a group of 10,000 can defeat an army of 135,000. Well, it's still not time to fight. God told Gideon that he still 
had too many men. So their numbers were reduced according to how they drank water out of the brook. If they lapped the water from their hands as a dog would, they would get to fight. There were only 300 out of the 10,000 who drank this way. God then told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and I will give you victory over the Midianites. And surprise, surprise, you know what? Gideon still isn't fully convinced. God tells him, if you are still afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servants, listen to what the Midianites are saying, and you will be greatly encouraged. Then you'll be eager to attack. So Gideon creeps creeps down to, to their camp, And he crawls up alongside a tent and he hears a man telling his companion about a dream. The man said, I had this dream and in my dream a loaf of barley bread came tumbling down into the Midianite camp. It hit a tent, it turned it over and it knocked it flat. His companion answered, your dream can only mean one thing. God has given Gideon, the Israelite, victory over Midian and all of his allies. Now, finally, Gideon was convinced it was time to fight. Gideon goes about breaking his army into three groups of a hundred and they surround the Midianites. They blew their trumpets and they crashed their clay jars with lights in them. And get this, each man stood at his position around the camp and watch the Midianites rush around in a panic, shouting as they ran to escape. When the 300 Israelites blew their ram horns, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against one another with their swords. Gideon and his army of 300 didn't even have to raise a sword. God interceded for them. God went before them. All they needed to do was take a stand for God, and God did the rest. And it's an incredible encouragement for us that we may not need to do the fight or actually undertake the battle itself, but we may need and be called to take the stand for God and to let Him do the rest. There's so much more to the story, but, and I am conscious about time, so please go and read it as I suggested earlier. But what does all of this mean for us today? You see, the thing is that God can use ordinary people to do ordinary things in a great way. And God can use ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things. You see, from the very beginning, Gideon was not overly impressive. The story opens with him hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat. Gideon was scared. He reminded God, I'm from the weakest family and I'm the runt of the litter. You don't want me. But God let Gideon know, you're just the man for the job. With Gideon, the key factor was his willingness to obey God. God calls all of us. He calls the weak, the scared, the uncertain, the unqualified. It doesn't matter who you are. You have gifts from God, which you can use to bring Him honor and glory. And God calls us to action. God calls us to follow Him. Even when we're not sure what we're called to do, or it seems overly difficult, God promises us that He will be with us. He will not fail us. He will not abandon us. Even if the odds are 45,000 to 1, like they were with the Israelites fighting against the Midian, if God calls you to follow Him, He will see you through the battles that may lie ahead. And another encouragement for us, particularly as a church, Another thing that we can learn is a small number of people who are following God's lead can do much more than we can imagine. 
When we have the collective belief and trust in the promises of God, of what he can and will do through us, we can and we will do amazing things. God loves to demonstrate his amazing power when we trust what he can do through us. When we finally climb out of the wine press of life and we demonstrate without fear who God is in our, is in our lives, I believe we will be doing more than amazing things. But we've got to believe it's possible. Gideon struggled with trusting and believing. And the another point is that God is incredibly gracious and patient with us. Especially when our faith is weak. After the first fleece sign, Gideon told God, don't be angry with me. Let me make one more request. And our God is a merciful, loving and patient God who knows our weaknesses. Jesus said that we are in a generation which seeks signs from false prophets who, are, who will supposedly lead us to Christ, but won't. Yet God was willing to let Gideon ask and ask again for signs. God understood Gideon. And in the same way, God understands our weaknesses and our insecurities. When it comes to testing God, we're ultimately told not to test God. Yet we can identify with Gideon. He wanted to be sure that it really was God's voice he was hearing and that he understood his directions. He asked God for a sign to prove that this truly was his will. And if we're really honest, I don't think that too many of us are very different to Gideon. From Gideon's example, we can learn that no matter how great the odds against us may be, our faithful God is sovereign and he will always see us through whatever battles we face in our lives. As long as we remain faithful to his calling and obedient to his commands. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6 reads, Trust the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Friends, I hope that out of this message today, that you will take some encouragement that Regardless of the battles that you're facing in your life, that regardless of how you view yourself as weak or incompetent or unqualified, your God, our God, is merciful and loving, and He only sees you as a mighty hero. I love you, friends. Look after yourselves, and we'll hopefully see you soon.